Okay. Today is the 5th of September. Okay. So we, we measure dimensions. Our units, which are attached to our measurements, have to agree. So it makes no sense whatsoever to say, should we be worried? I mean, she left quite a while ago. How long has she been gone? About 30 meters. <sighs> okay, I'm not going to quit my day job and become a cartoonist. Um, I, I did have a student once who said, well, then what about people who say, well, how far are you from Pittsburgh? Hmm, about an hour. Is there a problem with that statement? How far are you from Pittsburgh? About an hour. What is packed into that answer? What is assumed? Oh, beyond that, what is assumed? So assumed in that answer is a rate, which, yes, you were getting to, because even if you're traveling in a vehicle, um, especially getting into Pittsburgh, your rate of travel can be highly variable depending on what time of day you leave. Um, it's assuming a rate of travel. How far are you from Pittsburgh? Not 60 kilometers. Okay, that is a distance. How long would it take you to get to Pittsburgh? Hmm, about an hour. Okay, that's reasonable. So we do a lot of measurement in physics. Um, and I, I will, if you give me something without units, I will kick it back to you. Um, you got to have units. Because if you don't have units, it's just a nonsense number. So as we are taking measurements, we got to think about two things, accuracy and precision. Our goal is always to be both. So accurate means it's close to true. It's close to the correct value. Um, if you are measuring the speed of an object, well, okay, let's think about the speedometer in your car. If the speedometer in your car is accurate, it is telling you the actual speed you are going. And if the state highway patrol officer who's sitting there with the radar <laughs> is pointing it at your car, and her radar and your speedometer are both accurate, they should read the same thing. They should read the true value of your speed at that moment. That's good. Because this is correct close to the true value. Now, what if your speedometer consistent, and I actually had a car that did this, my 82 VW Rabbit, um, consistently read about two miles per hour under how fast I was actually going. How do you think I found that out? Um, they'll give you three miles over the speed limit. They won't give you five. <laughs> Oops. Um, but it, and I just learned to adjust my own behavior, it consistently was a little off. It was consistent. The amount of error was consistent. It was making the same kind of measurement again and again and again. That is precision. So replicable. So we usually think of this in terms of the target. Um, being accurate is hitting the bullseye. Being precise is being able to cluster your shots. Like I said, our goal is to be both. So if you are precise, do you know what the true value is? No. You aren't getting a picture of what the true value is. Um, you're getting a picture of how good the instrument is. All right. Why might we be inaccurate? Well, there are two possible reasons. Method error. Anybody ever measure something using two different methods relatively close together? Relatively recently? <laughs> um, do two different measurement methods generally get you results that are pretty replicable? You measure the same cylinder using two dramatically different methods. And nobody, nobody got crazy creative. I had a group one year that took the cylinders, put down a meter stick. Oh, there's my little friend. 
got lots of little orthopterans in here this year. It's wonderful. <clears throat> Mark a spot on this and rolled the darn thing. The most creative method I had ever seen. It was terrible. I mean, it was grossly inaccurate. It was horribly imprecise. It was every bad thing about a measurement method you could get, which is perfect for this lab. Because that's kind of the point, is realizing that there are a whole lot of ways to do it. But what you have to have is something that gets you close to a true value, that gets you an accurate answer, and that allows you to replicate that measurement. So if you just do two different methods for massing something or for measuring the length of something, you may very well get some inaccuracies. If you're just sloppy. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about parallax error. We'll do this first. Okay, so I want you all to stick your thumb out and cover up something in the room. Close one eye. I've got a plant covered up with my thumb. Now, change eyes. Does your thumb hop? You can cover up somebody's head. That's a favorite. Try doing it on an object closer to you and an object further away. So like I was aiming at those plants, and I'm going to try to cover up Mark's ear. Don't move, Mark. What if I aim out the window and I cover up that phone pole? Does the amount of jump that you see change based on how far away the object is? It depends, honestly, on how your eyes work together. Um, the amount of parallax error, so that is parallax error. Parallax error is an error in measurement based on the perspective of the viewer. This is something that's actually, parallax is actually deliberately exploited in astrophysics. So if I measure from latitude 44 north and however far west we are, I think we're 40 west here, something like that, like 4440. Um, if I measure the distance to a planet or a star and someone at an observatory in Bogota in South America and we know the distance between the two observer points we can actually use that information to figure out with more accuracy how far away the planet is because we're going to see a hop in its position not we don't measure distance we measure relative position but that parallax is actually exploited. Now, what happens if your eyes don't work together well and you have a hard time forming a single image and you're using a tape measure and you close one eye to get your measurement one time and you close the other eye the other time? Does that change your measurement? Yes. Um, this is, I'm, I do a little bit of woodworking and this is an error that I commonly make. I have cut many pieces and gone to fit them all together and gone because I'm really bad about that and my eyes don't make one image um, together they don't work right which is okay <laughs> it's the way they are um, <clears throat> but that is parallax error and me not making sure I'm closing the same eye every time is sloppiness nothing to blame but my own sloppiness and I need to put a patch over one eye um, that gets you error that gets you inaccuracy. Now the other thing is actual bad instruments. And I would like to share with you some relics from a past age. Let's see. These aren't even the relics. Oh, that one's sort of a relic. Here, have a relic. Oh, it's, it's so sad to me. We're getting to a point where nobody knows who Mr. Stuby was when I say Mr. Stuby. Oh, Mr. Stuby. Mr. Stuby was a relic of a past age. I absolutely, absolutely adored the man. Um, he, at the point when I started teaching with Mr. Stuby, he had been teaching longer than I had been alive. He started teaching before I was born. Um, he was a crusty, curmudgeon old man who knew more science than, you know, anybody. Awesome. And some of these meter sticks are actually hand-me-downs with care, they're sacred relics, um, from the room of Mr. Stuby. Now, oh, you know what, I may have taped the work ones together. Uh, I did. <clears throat> if you look carefully at the ends of these, anybody, ooh, sorry. <laughs> anybody got a rounded end? Hold on, let me, let me grab. Check the 
Many of them have some amount of damage on the end. If you start <clears throat> by butting the end of that up against something, <clears throat> you may or may not be getting a full millimeter on the end. Now, my ruler collection is even worse, as perhaps you noticed. I've been working with damaged measuring devices for so long that I habitually start at 10 centimeters on a meter stick and add 10 to my measurement, because you're not going to wear off 10. But most of these have at least worn off a half a millimeter on the end. And if you're going for a really good, really accurate measurement, that matters. Now, in here, are we building rockets to Mars? No, we are not. Are we constructing things that will safely transport humans anywhere? No, we are not. Um, but are we making measurements? Yeah, and the goal is to make them as accurately as possible. So we want to watch for damaged instruments, accommodate if necessary, use non-damaged instruments when possible, and we want to not be sloppy. So we've got these special meter sticks, and I say that they're a meter long. They're completely covered in tape. You can't read the measurements. If you can read the measurements, you're trying too hard. Um, the whole point is that you can't. So go ahead and measure the length of a book or a notebook or an iPad or something. What you got, Eddie? Uh, green tape. Green tape, OK. So here's the thing. This works really well. I'm going to steal this from you, Eddie. Thank you. This works really well if I want to say, yeah, OK, well, I'm more than a meter tall. Hey, you know what? I'm actually almost, I'm like a meter and a half tall. Now, I happen to know that I'm 165 centimeters tall. So, well, 167, but I think it's 165 now. It's sad. It happens to all of us. Um, <clears throat> so, the best I can do with this is I can say, yes, it's a meter, or mm, about a half. Are my eyeballs good enough to say 0.1? No. And I don't care if you think you have caliper eyeballs, you don't. So with something like this, there is no mark. It is literally one meter. The best that we can do is say it's either one or it's a half. Now, try the same measurement that you just made using the marked meter stick. You get, did I steal yours? There you go. And barring tape on the ends and other cool things like that. What do you get? What do you get, Matt? Be careful here. 25. Do we just say 25? So let's let's draw some. So I'm gonna I'm gonna abscond with your measurements, Matt, and we'll we'll say that we've landed right there. Would we call that just? Would we record that measurement as just 35 centimeters? Or are we lacking the level of precision that is allowable by the instrument? OK. So I hear 35.00. Anybody else got another one? Centimeters. We got room for more measurements. Do I hear 35.0? OK. Somebody wanted to say that, but they were too chicken. That's OK. Bok, 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 bok. Um, I miss my chickens, so I have to balk occasionally. Okay, so we've got three possible options. Defend your answer. Talk at your table. Talk with the people sitting around you. Why are you right and everybody else is full of it? So nobody's going to defend this answer either? Does that mean you think it's wrong? Because I heard some of you suggested it. Yes, you should. You can always have one more digit than the last one marked on your instrument. 
so in this case, so let's let's say that I had made it. Let's say I had told you that it ended ah, too thick. We had gotten something that we measured right there. How would you record that? Discuss it at your table. Come up with an answer as a group. Right on that mark. Okay, so we all we all agree on thirty five point what? Point six zero centimeters. Why point six zero? Because it is dead on. There's no fudge after that thirty five point six. It is three hundred and fifty six millimeters. Now, let me see if I can expand this at all. How would you record that? 35.65. Now, on, on a scale this small, let's talk about that. On a scale this small, we traditionally would say, you can, you can say it's dead on and it's 35.60, or you can say that it's 35.65 centimeters. Your eyeballs, I mean, look at that scale. Now, I'm blowing this up tremendously. Are your eyeballs good enough to say, no, that's 35.7? I don't think so. I don't care how young your eyeballs are. You're not that good. Get over yourself. Um, so typically on something this tiny, we would say, yeah, you really can only go on or halfway in between. Now, if you look at that green stick that I gave you again, the stupid green meter stick, on something this large, could we say, yeah, like 0.3? We probably could. So on this, we could, we could use this and say, mm, 0.3. Now, could we say like 0.25? No. We couldn't because we're going out one more place than we really can verify. We can go one decimal beyond the last mark. On that green stick, you have no decimals. It's just one. On this, you're down to millimeters. All right, so good with that? Sig figs! Um, sig figs are what we're using to keep track of these levels of precision. So, in this class, we will be using spring scales. Like, when we take our southern hemisphere friends sledding this winter, um, <laughs> I'm so excited about this. Um, we're gonna need to find snow suits for you folks, aren't we? <laughs> We are. That instrument is what you're going to use to measure the force that you're exerting on an object. When you do that, guess who's responsible for knowing how many sig figs you have to have? The person who took the measurements. Ha! You. So you have to accurately record the sig figs. Let's see if we can expand this picture a little bit. So we'll be measuring in Newtons. These are measured every Newton. So you could measure 6.5 Newtons, 8.5, 9.0, 15.5. Could you reliably measure 21.8 Newtons on this? No. And these scales are pretty small. I mean, again, that's massively expanded. And even then, it would probably be hard to get anything beyond a half. But you're, you're going to just give it, you know, 1.0, 1.5, okay? But that, we're, we're keeping track of how detailed the instrument that you were using to make the measurements was. So when you produce all your measurements and you do all your calculations, and I look at your lab and grade your lab, I'll actually look back to the instrument you used to determine if you got your sig figs right. It's no longer just about working with the numbers you were given. It's about making sure that you've collected the right number of sig figs and kept track of those throughout your calculations. And that's this part. Um, we move to a lot of that in this class, taking your own measurements. Now, we also have a lot of problems because we need to practice problems, so we do use practice problems from the book and from other sources. And in that case, you're getting measurements from someone else but you have to follow those sig fig rules.
to track the level of precision. So how many of you remember all the sig fig rules and have it down handily? Okay, do you want to do the three second review? Okay. Okay, so rule number one, if it's not zero, it's significant. You knew that. 7,352, everything is significant. What if I have 730050? Once we get to zeros, we have those special weird rules for zeros. And to do the, the fast review, if it's between two non-zeros, yes. So this is, this is. If it's at the end of a number, but in front of the decimal, it is not significant, not significant. If it's at the beginning of a number, I guess I should move these somewhere. If it's at the beginning of a number behind the decimal, also not significant. If it's at the end of a number, so these are not significant. If it's at the end of a number after the decimal, guess what? Yes and yes. So that's just determining whether or not they are. I do have a practice sheet for you. Um, this is one that will not be graded. It is purely for your own whatever. I'm going to stick paper copies here. The same sheet is linked on the chapter plan, and the key is linked. So if you want to check yourself on a few of these, do a few, check them. I'm not grading it. It's not a five-point practice or anything like I did in chemistry. Um, it's just to make sure that you know you're getting it. Okay. So do a couple in each section and call it a day. Um, rounding, I don't think, I had that paused. When we're adding and subtracting, because we do line up the decimals, um, sig figs in the final answer are governed by the thing with the least number of sig figs. So we would end there. So let's see. 9.59. Now, we can only have something out to this space. But what's our final answer going to be? 9.6 centimeters. Because we do have to round based on whatever follows. When we're multiplying, so we have an answer of 20 what centimeters. Is there anything after the 2 zero? What governs our answer, the number of sig figs allowed in our answer in multiplication and division, because our decimals do line up. We go back to every value that went into that calculation, and we look at how many sig figs the thing with the least sig figs had. So the least sig figs in this case is this number. How many sig figs are there? One. So our answer is literally just 20 centimeters. This is probably a measurement that was made on an instrument that really lacked precision, something that didn't even have millimeter marks, perhaps. Um, we don't know. And that's the other thing, is when you get a set of measurements from someone else, you don't know if they've properly tracked sig figs. But your only choice is still to go with what they've done. Okay. Okay, so referring back to the plan, um, go ahead and do the practice problems that are assigned. Those will be due tomorrow. And so do those. This will move to tomorrow when you walk in. That's terrible. This is totally optional. This is on your own if you want to do it. If you don't want to do it, I'm not going to chase you down. I'm not going to do anything. It's all up to you. So.